so manisha my first question is go back on your system nanke yeah and it seems that you are decommissioning the design tool what happened to that system um we're just let's see that could be a mistake Oh, that's not being, I don't think it's being decommissioned. Okay, so is that in still in the system landscape? I think it should be, yeah. Okay. So the actual design and everything is happening in that tool. How the files are loaded in Salesforce then? We would have to save them to some central file system. And how that would work? So let's so the design tool stores all the files right now in the right. back office. Yeah. So how that integration would work, and which systems would be involved there? So I would um, assume that they're still gonna. It's a desktop. I really thought that said they were decommissioning it somewhere. <laughs> so it's, supposing they're not, um, the it says that the system specialist desktops are where they reside. So if they're still creating them, I would. Uh, bring in a process that they have to save them to some central file uh, server. And then the, we can have an ETL job that detects that a new file is there and would have to have some naming convention to associate it with the right uh, customer, such as like a customer number or something. And then the ETL job could then bring it in using that files migration process I went through. So using the REST API um, and then saving it to content version associated to the right record. Okay. Now another requirement there is the file size could be uh, 100 MB size or it can be larger than that. If you go on the requirement yep. number six in the system landscape. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I made an assumption there. I forgot to mention that, that it would not be over two gigabytes. If it was, we would have to store it externally, which we are, I do have um, AWS S3. So we could, if we did have, if it was too big, we could just put it straight in S3 and then associate it with the customer record and save it in the in the folder that's associated with the customer record. Okay, so what what is your final answer? Are you so if your assumption is right? What yeah, your... I'm just going to use files if my assumption is correct. Okay, now let's assume that file size is 500 MB, and in your system landscape, it seems that you are using mobile publisher for the customer. Yep. Do you see any impact of this decision on that mobile app? Um. Oh, for the customer to view the files because they're not going to be uploading them. They would be viewing them. They would be viewing them. How they can, they, they mm -hmm. can, I believe that they can view them. They, you, so the file size limit actually comes in when you're trying to upload a file. And it's actually, it's a hundred megabyte. It's actually not a hard limit, but if they needed to upload a file, I'd have to take that into consideration. If it's just viewing a file, um, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Uh, Varuna? Yeah, so, so are you going to keep the design tool or are you going to deprecate that? I I really thought it said in here that we needed to deprecate it, but I might be wrong. I could have gotten that confused with the different scenario I worked on two days ago. <laughs> so I, if they need to create the design documents using the design tool, we're going to keep it. Okay. All right. So on the landscape, uh, Marissa, you have AWS uh, S3 here uh, uh, in the, on the landscape. Yeah. But also in the... Uh, Another migration of file you you propose AWS uh, like a data warehouse as well. Yeah. So what uh, is it missing on the landscape or? Mm. Sorry, I AWS is supposed to just represent AWS for data. So I, that's why I wrote both data and files here, and then S three is the S three buckets within AWS because it's it's all in the AWS stack. 
So it'd be like it would be an AWS data warehouse. So I should just wrote DW to make it more clear. Okay. So uh, can you go to the next uh, uh, your uh, use agent slash open ID uh, flow? Sure. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, can you explain to me what what use case at what point this will be used? Sure. So that's for the customers using the mobile app. So uh, the mobile publisher, I'm assuming, uses the mobile SDK, which is uses the user agent flow. But because they can sign in with social sign on, that's going to use the Open ID Connect flow. So you know when they open up the mobile app, they can choose to click like Facebook or LinkedIn, or whatever, to to log in to Salesforce from the app. So first, the app's going to go through the user agent flow with Salesforce and request the access token from the client ID. That's going to go to the authorization endpoint. And then it's going to, the Salesforce is going to redirect and see that they're trying to log in with their social credentials, which uses that auth provider um, I mentioned. So the auth provider has the URL endpoint for um, the OpenID Connect provider, such as Facebook or LinkedIn, sends a request to the authorization endpoint, checks to see if they already have a session. If they don't, pre presents an authorization and consent screen to the user. Uh, which it, they have to consent to the scopes. And then once they do that, an authorization code response is sent back to the client, which then calls back to Salesforce with that authorization code. And then Salesforce will uh, post to the token endpoint of the OpenID Connect provider, um, the client ID, the client, client secret, and the authorization code to make sure that this user is authorized, and then once that's validated, it, the uh, it will send back the actual access token as well as an ID token, since this is Open ID Connect. And then that's when the registration handler for the auth provider would kick in. So um, it would then find the user and log them in. They would then consent again, and then um, the access token is sent to the the client. And then they will be able to use the using the redirect API, and they'll be able to connect with uh, serve resources from Salesforce. So uh, what is that? how many times the user has to con provide consent? Um, I believe it's twice here because they have to consent when they log in to the OpenID Connect provider for it to be used with Salesforce. And they also have to uh, consent to Salesforce for their um, with their scopes there because um, they would, it would be using two different flows here. Okay. So, uh, so user logs in and then assume they uh, do something on uh, through Facebook. Yeah. Uh, assume they had to log in again, you know, uh, for another reason. Uh, do you have to provide consent again for both uh, Facebook and uh, connected app? Not if they're already logged into Facebook. No, that's why here it's going to check to see um, if they already have a Facebook session established. They're only going to do the authorization and consent if they don't have a Facebook session already established. So Melissa, how do you, uh, are you saying when you connect to the token endpoint, you're going to get access token and the ID token together? Yes, since it's um, oh, since it's open ID connect, there will be an ID token that gets returned. So you're going to get two tokens at the same call? I believe so, yes. Yep. Uh, so, you're going to get the ID to open regardless for each, every time you go to open ID connect provider. Yeah. Even if they don't want to use it, it is usually sent back in an open ID connect call. Okay. All right. To be used with the user info endpoint to retrieve more information about the user if necessary, like anything else that might be needed to match them or something. Yeah, so is it a separate call you to make, or is it if you want to, if you want to call the user info endpoint, yes, you would use that ID token and send that to the user info endpoint. It's an optional uh, step in this. I didn't draw it out because it's not, you know, I'm assuming that we don't need it. But if we did, then a uh, additional call could be made to the uh, Open ID Connect user info endpoint with that ID token. Okay. All right. Did you know what next? I think we are good with the system uh, section. Let's go on the data model. So in the data model, uh, why do we need a case as an external object here? Uh, what is the reason for that? No? Let me try to remember what that is. Oh, um, that is if we're going to, so I'm proposing that we archive cases once they're closed. 
and then we can just re re expose them back. It didn't say that they needed to see case history. That's just um, if they needed to go back and see any case history, we can expose it as an external object when it's archived. So wh why you're archiving it? What is the data volume for case per year? Yep. So <clears throat> let me make this a little smaller. This is kind of out of control. I came up with it around five years that it's going to be over 6 million cases. So this is when we're going to want to start archiving those cases or it, think about them before that five year mark. So I see you have a lot of large data volumes here. You have asset, you have case, you have work order. Work order is not large data volume yet. I, I just put that there because it because it's something to take into consideration that it's still kind of under that threshold, but could hit it with, you know, after that five years or um, because this is a rough estimate, so it could even be higher. Mm -hmm. So which objects are the LDV in your calculation other than case? It's just device and case. Okay. So I see in your data in your data model, you have external object for case, but you have nothing for the asset. How would you handle the data volume in asset? So I didn't, um, so I, I did mention that on here, but I didn't draw it. So um, archive those so this is the thing is if the key if the assets are no longer in use we'd want to archive them to the data warehouse um and expose those as external objects if we do need access to their history as well so then we'd have to associate those devices with the archived cases so there would be another uh asset object here um associated to the case and then okay. account can you go back on your yeah, slide again? I, I do see you mentioned some word related to the sensitive data for the asset on the LDV long term. Yeah. And you're using uh, external object. How you're handling the security? Yeah, so the, we can't handle security with Salesforce platform security. So um, since I mentioned they don't contain sensitive data, it's just more reference data. There's no clear security requirements around them. I thought that those are good candidates to be uh, used with external objects. So we just have to turn off, you know, the searchability and reporting. Um, and they would be seen as a list view associated to the account that they're related to through the lookup. And how about, is there any other way? So for example, case is also an external object. Mm -hmm. They definitely have a requirement uh, because your case is a private or the is a private. How you're handling the case external object security there? Um, yeah, so you, you can't do that with um, Salesforce security either. So um, it would just be cases related to the account really a list there as well. Same thing, turn off the search and uh, reporting on them. So the uh, users would only see the cases and assets where the, uh, they have a look up to the account, but they could use something like a URL directly to that external object to see them. So my assumption here is there's not really any sensitive data. Um, if they did determine that they didn't want, they really wanted to be specific, we could create a lightning web component and a request reply um, pattern to just virtualize the data and show cases and assets. Okay, well enough. Yeah, so on the data model, uh, Melissa, you have a uh, order standard object and then you have a uh, order uh, custom, sorry, external object as well, is it? Yeah. So is it because you're going to archive them? Uh, well, there, it's both. So, um, no, I'm not archiving them, sorry. Um, it's because they want, there's a requirement to be able to see order information from the ERP and Salesforce. Okay. Okay. So detailed order data in the ERP system should be viewable or accessible from within Salesforce. So uh, that's why I said we could just expose them as external objects and link them to the order and account to see the more detailed ERP information. Okay. So the additional data is going to be on the order object. Okay. And what kind of relationship between you have between the external object and Salesforce object? There's, they're just they're just lookups, regular lookups. Regular lookups. Yep. Uh, Using the Salesforce kind of, Salesforce record ID. Okay. What's uh, what are the different types of lookups you can have between external object and a Salesforce object? You can have external lookups, so that would be Salesforce looking up to the external object, mm -hmm. and you can have indirect lookups where you use some other uh, use some other field that's not the Salesforce record ID to do the lookup from the external object to the Salesforce object. 
okay so you expect uh, the erp system to store the salesforce external id salesforce id to uh, store the salesforce id so if we when we send the data to the erp if we can't modify it to save the salesforce record uh, actually it might not be a good idea to sell, store that salesforce record we probably would want to use something like an order number and then use that uh, and use an indirect lookup instead so as part of your data migration are you going to go back and update the erp uh oh after we bring the data into salesforce or you mean in the integrations so when we send the data to the erp update the erp with the salesforce record number is that what you're asking um uh, in your data migration you are bringing in some orders too right from uh, erp yeah. yeah we will want that we would want that erp order number actually i would think in salesforce so the yeah there is some requirements for linking the data between systems so we're going to have to make use of external ids to link between erp and salesforce the monitoring systems in salesforce yeah, so Melissa, are you going to be storing the erps the unique number in the external id of salesforce or are you going to go back and update the uh, salesforce id in, in erp if we use the regular lookup field we would have to go back and update the ERP with the Salesforce record ID for the orders. Is it a proposed solution? Um, I would think it would be better to store the ERP order number in Salesforce and then use um, an indirect lookup to match on the, the ERP order ID instead of storing the Salesforce IDs in the downstream systems. Okay. Good, thank you. Um, is there any, any questions on data model? Yeah, one question I have on the data migration. So, uh, Malita, why I see in the data migration you are bringing the data from the monitoring system to the staging DB? Are you uh, to match to do the matching to the correct account and contact using the external ID so that we then can bring it into the canonical database? Um, but which mon which monitoring data you are bringing inside Salesforce? The devices. The the, the it it mentioned that we need to bring the devices. Okay. Um, all devices from the three monitoring systems need to be replicated into Salesforce. So that's also where, you know, I really took that literally, and I'm like, all right, we have to bring those in as assets. Assets don't have implication on storage, so why not just store them and and deal with the LDV? Um, but we probably could get away with storing them externally and, and still calling that being replicated to Salesforce. Okay. So Melissa, are you, what is your proposed solution for the data migration? Are you going big bang data load or how the- Oh, uh, no, I mentioned we're gonna use, so iterative data loads is what I proposed with uh, Delta loads after the initial data load, not big bang. So can, can you share the plan that uh, how the initial data load and the Delta load would happening? Yes, so we would want to do the initial data load within a migration window well before we decide to cut over to production to alleviate as many issues as possible as early as possible. And then we'll want to have some subsequent uh, data migration windows that can be smaller because then we can do delta loads and we want to do that on a regular basis, maybe like every week or every two weeks to make sure the data is staying up to date um, because do migrating all the data at once could cause some issues um and then we would probably uh risk not hitting the timeline okay uh, can you go back on your uh data model and in the data model i see you have account object and you have a location object mm -hmm. and they are related are they the standard object or how that's working. Account is standard. I'm proposing since I'm using service cloud that we could use the standard location object. It doesn't have an out of the box lookup to account. So we'd have to create a custom lookup. And so why you're using the part of the location object, uh, why you're not using the other. So there is associated location. Associated location because it, um, there was a requirement to associate multiple devices to, um, or multiple, to have multiple locations the, the, I didn't see the need for it. So um, the associated location would have multiple accounts related to one location, but also multiple locations related to one account. And I just figured we could use a direct lookup between location 
an account and bypass using that. Okay. Make it more simple. Okay. Around the maintenance schedule object, uh, if you uh, if you go the schedule maintenance requirement number one. So, can you explain me how uh, the requirement number one in the schedule maintenance is fulfilling your data model? The maintenance schedule is set uh, when the installation is complete and managed by the support center. Um, each location is surfaced twice a year. So the maintenance is actually going to be a work order and the work order will be associated to um, <clears throat> a location which is associated to an asset. So um, we would have to, yeah, that's, it's going to tell us multiple assets that, so this is my assumption is that it said it is customer location is serviced twice a year. So that's why I didn't have the look up from work order to asset for that maintenance because it's, it's said by location. So I'm, I'm assuming the maintenance happens per location at all assets per location. But if we needed to do individual maintenance on individual assets, um, <clears throat> I have the work order line item looking up to the asset to tell us which individual assets will be serviced. So, so Marisa, you, you, uh, I lost there. As per the requirement number one, what is your final solution? I'm My assumption is it's just going to happen per location. So whatever assets are at that location will be serviced on the work order and be associated to the work order line items. And what is what is the purpose of this maintenance schedule object then? Um, to just go and probably, I would say, to do a check on the devices at the location to make sure they're working okay or... Yeah, you already have you already have a work order. Uh, is there any requirement anywhere related to that object? That's the the maintenance. So the customer location is serviced. So that's telling me that something has to be done at the location. So the work order would be assigned to whoever's doing the the maintenance. Right. So why do we need a maintenance schedule object? Um, it tells us how often um we could just have the maintenance schedule associated to the location i see what you're saying it could just be fields on the location object so what what change you're suggesting here in your solution just remove the maintenance schedule object okay what or not yeah so uh, yeah, so uh, Manisa, uh, you have uh, right now, uh, you can know in your object model, you can say, you, you know which contacts relate to which account. What if you want to know these contacts are working in which location? Is it the requirement is to find out a contact is working on this location and not this one? How do you, can you maintain that? Uh, we'd have to have a look up um, from contact to location if they're only working at one location or we'd have to have a junction object if the contacts can be working at multiple locations. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. Uh, can you go to your data migration? Slide. Yeah. So if you look at the order of the uh, load, you say leads, accounts, contacts, and then you are uh, updating locations. So how do you... We would have to switch that around. Locations would have to go first and then the contacts. Okay. And then we'd have to have a we'd load into a junction object how they're related. Actually, uh, if we have a junction object, we'd have to load locations and contacts and then populate that junction object as to how they're related. Okay, so Marisa, on the previous uh, your change you did, you're gonna uh, capture the maintenance schedule under location. So assume you know they must serve like twice a twice a year for each location. So how do you keep track of uh, for the last say five years, what is the status where the uh, maintenance was done? The work uh, order would, would track that. So the, the work order would represent the maintenance that has actually been completed. So if we wanna have a separate schedule object, um, we could have that look up directly to the location as well. Okay, all right. And uh, uh, last question, so how do you assign 
who is going to go which specialist is going to go and perform the maintenance schedule you mean the contractor or, or yeah. actually you know it did mention it said system specialist but i assumed it was probably supposed to be contractor so um they would have to do we could give them a search tool to to figure out who is available in the location near where the maintenance has to be performed that didn't mention that as a requirement but we could just build something that would that would find them yeah. and then we could assign them so where are going to assign them in the work order or they would be assigned to the work order so we could create when the work order is created we could we could give them like a, a lightning web component with a button to say find local um find people that are local that can work on this and we'd I'm not using field service lightning, but this is a capability of field service lightning that we could easily bring that in to find who's available and assign them to the work orders. But if we don't want, I'm not proposing to bring in field service lightning at this point, because that's a lot to try to implement in four months. So we just have to build some sort of just native um, primitive tool that can just show us who's within local geography. We can use this local distance query based on the geography of the location and the we could have those coordinates saved on the user record where they're located. Okay, sir. Their uh, home location. Okay, got it. So Melissa, can you go to schedule maintenance number three? Yeah. Yeah, so here it says they want to uh, update the orders or, or, or details in real time. So yeah. you Post uh, uh, platform events. Yep. Are you considering that to be real time? Yep. So if if it's, I, I guess it's it's more near real time. If they really want it to go straight to the ERP as soon as they click the button with no lag at all, we could do a requ request reply callout. It didn't mention that we needed any response back, so that's why I wasn't going to propose that. And that just an asynchronous platform event would be sufficient but if they decide they really do want that uh, we can create another lightning clip component using apex to create that call out to the esb and then update the erp and get some sort of status back to say uh this service order is updated okay uh so what if uh, you know this erp uh times out uh, how do you yep. handle this Yep, that's that's why I was, you know, we, there is that um, there is that risk. So um, we could try to use the continuation service for long running callouts to mitigate that risk. If it still doesn't suffice, then I would say we'd want to use something like a platform event and go near real time, so that we're not waiting for the response when the user is on that screen. Especially if they're on a mobile device, it could be slower, and then they would just get some sort of notification back. It's it, um, more asynchronously that it was updated. Did you want to go next? Yes. So, uh, Melissa, there was a requirement related to the barcode and mm -hmm. who went with uh, LWC solution. Yeah. Uh, can you explain which library you're planning to use for that? Not the Salesforce one that's in beta, but um, we would have to use just a JavaScript barcode library. Uh, we could even look at maybe an app exchange app to make it easier for the scanning purposes. So if they click a button from the app, it would launch. Well, no, that I don't actually. Um, they would actually have to install that, I believe. Um, we could we could potentially use an app exchange app there, but it would just be a JavaScript barcode library if we want to try to build it ourselves. So what is your final solution? I'm just going to go with JavaScript. So for the JavaScript, you don't know the which library is going to work. So do you see any kind of the risk on the project timeline saying that it's only four months? Yeah. So if we don't want to in introduce any risk, we'll go with App Exchange. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have another question. Uh, can you go to integration number two? I, I do have a question about that afterwards. So let's revisit that. The, the uh, App Exchange app. So can you go to integration number two? This one? Uh, number two, the second one. Uh, Sales and design number two? 
No, integration number two. Oh, yeah, sorry, integ- sorry. Integration number two. Yeah. So in this, uh, yeah, it's on. Uh, let's see. It's under contracting and insulation point number five A. Yeah, right there. Yeah. So uh, for that integration, now you uh, we are going to create the order in uh, in ERP, right? Yep, the order is created in Salesforce, and then we're going to create the associated um, sales order in the ERP. Yeah. So what if uh, you have to send the order and the order lines? Both. Oh yeah, if we the for the line items, we want to make a call back into Salesforce to get those line items. So uh, when the ESB receives that um, platform event, it will then make a call back into Salesforce using the REST API to get the line items. And then after that, what will happen? And then it will send the order and all the line items to the ERP system. Okay, so ESP would do the uh, the combination of the order and the order line items. Yes, it would be through an art orchestration. Okay, so how would they know which uh, ERP? Uh, because some items are in the yep. based on country, which I mentioned that. So the ESB has an orchestration to determine the correct ERP based on the country. So it would have it would have to have some logic to know that whatever country this orders for, whether it's US or Canada, um, it would know which ERP system to send the order to. Okay, all right. thank you. Get you another next. So, Melissa, go on the requirement number four dot B uh, of the sales cycle, sales and design. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain me your solution and how you're handling the attachment here? Attachment in an email. So the system specialist will be on site, right? So they'll be taking pictures, taking videos. Um, So they'll use the Salesforce One mobile app and then just attach them to the order on the files related list. Um, And then to create, to send the estimate to the customer, they will be on the order and they can have a quick action to create um, estimate for a customer review, which would then get sent to the customer using DocuSign. And then do you want me to go over the GPS stuff? No, why why DocuSign? Because we are not asking for any signature. It's just DocuSign DocGen. Okay, DocuSign DocGen. Yeah. Now now the question is it is pretty much possible that customer may ask for the multiple quotes. Yep. For with the different permutation and combination of the products. How you're handling that? Yeah, we, we could use quote for that. So um, I considered quote as well, and it said that it would be a pre- preliminary estimate. So we can have orders that are in draft copy before they get activated. So I felt like if they do need the history, then we might want to use something such as a quote. The customer wouldn't have access to the quote. We'd just only send them a copy of it using DocuSign. But I chose to use order so that the customer can log in and, and chatter on the order and collaborate on the order um, with customer community when they wouldn't have access to the quote object. So, Melissa, the requirement is there is possibility that the customer would come back and forth for the different kind of the quotes. Assuming that is the requirement, what is your final solution? Um, we could use quotes, and then um, we would just have to keep sending them uh, documents that represent what is in the quote for them to approve. And we would ha- they would have to collaborate on something else, um, like they're at the account level. Okay. And do you see impact, any impact of this decision on your overall solution? Um, so they have service licenses, which um, they can access quotes, but contractually, I'm not sure they're supposed to. So it would have impact, I would say, on licensing. Um they would probably need sales licenses. And contractors are working with the customers and the internal users. And if you're using a quote, contractor would need an access to quote. Yep. Any impact on the contractor's license? Yeah, it would. So uh, we would maybe just want to implement a custom object instead of dealing with all those impacts. That's why I chose to use order instead. 
and it it didn't mention that we need to track the history. So I figured we could just keep modifying the order, or we could even track history at a custom object if we needed to. So, what is your final solution? Are you going with the code custom object? Just, I'm just gonna I'm gonna stick with order because I know it works. And then if they want to track history, we can just track it through an, a, a custom object. So, how that custom object? So, I am a customer. I need let's say three code with a different combination of the products. How would that work? So let's say one quote has a 10 item, another quote has a 15 item, and another quote has a 25 items. How would that work? The custom object? Uh, we'd have to relate it to the different, uh, we'd have to relate to the custom, to the products. The custom object with the custom line, we'd have to basically replicate the quote, quote line item. So and why, why, would, would you like, why would you like to do that? If the sales was out of the box already suggesting that. So, all right, well, to think through this, we would have to, the internal users will have access to the quote with the sales cloud license. The external users would then have to have partner licenses to access the quote. And then the customers would not be able to access the quote at all. So we have to save the documents at the account level if we want to use out of the box Salesforce functionality. So what is your solution, Melissa? That's the question. Um, well, my, I like my solution because that's not a requirement, but if you're going to make that a requirement, I'll go with the quotes and change my licenses to partner and sales. Okay. Well enough. Yeah. So Melissa, uh, can you go to contracting and installation number one, come number one. Um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, can you explain to me how the contractors are created in Salesforce? It, it's not an actual contract. Uh, so oh, contractors, sorry, contractors. Oh, so they're created in the ERP first and there's mm -hmm. an integration here. So once they're created in the ERP, um, ERP will notify the ESP, which will make, uh, make a remote call in to Salesforce and then create the account and contact records. Mm -hmm. And then um, any, so it, then those accounts have to be locked in Salesforce because it mentions that um, they should not be created or updated in Salesforce. So only the integration user will be able to update those contractor records if any updates are made in the ERP. So you're going to create an account record, contact record. Uh, how are they going to get access to the community? So we would assign them um, a contractor profile that has community access, and then they'll receive an email to set their username and password since they're only using native credentials. So is it gonna be part of the integration? Um, the integration's not sending that, Salesforce is sending that email. So the, ER, the integration is gonna create the the records and assign the profile. When the profile is assigned, that's when they'll receive the email because the profile will be associated with the community they have access to or supposed to gain access to. Yes, and my question is that this integration, is it gonna create the account, contact and the user records? Yes, and the user record is what is associated to the contractor profile. Sorry, I left the user part out. So, uh, can you create accounts and uh, contact and the user on the same no, you would get a mixed DML error. So it would have to the user in would have to be in a separate thread from the account and contact. So we want to create the account and contact first and then in a separate thread create the user record. So who would do this separate thread? Um, we can actually have Salesforce um, we can create a platform event that will then subscribe when the account contractor account and contact are created, which would then create the user record asynchronously. So when the ESB creates those records, uh, then the users created afterwards, which will give them the community access. So explain to me again, uh, end to end, uh, Vanessa, so ESB is gonna create the account and contact. Yep. Who's gonna create the platform event? Um, so we could, we could have a flow, record triggered flow that checks to see um, that a contractor account was created. And then uh, we could subscribe to that using flow Subscribe. It will create the sorry record trigger flow. Will subscribe when the account is created. If it's a contractor account, it will create a platform event, which also can be subscribed to by a flow, which would then create the user record. 
Okay. Thank you. Do you have anything else? Okay. Uh, we have one minute left. Uh, can you go in the security section in the requirement number six? Sure. And explain how that requirement number six is addressed. So there are um, customers that need access to um, basically all the data in an account hierarchy. So the accounts are related through the parent field on the account. So there'll be a parent account and, and child accounts associated to that. And those customers will gain access to the, the data and the child accounts first through um, account contact relationships. So there'll be related contacts on those other accounts. And then for their specific primary customer profile, we'll have a sharing set where we'll have lookups on all the um, objects such as account, location, um, and assets where the um, the lookup is based on the related account field on the contact. So contact.related account equals the account lookup on those records. Okay, but what if uh, the lookup is not one level? Let's say there is what a location. Is, hold on, I gotta, how do I stop this? I just pause that, yeah, that's okay. So what if the location what? or account on, hierarchy? I... Oh, dismiss, there we go, okay. I couldn't yeah. hear you because my alarm was going off in my ears. So <laughs> that's, that's fine. So, so the question is, what if the relationship level between the accounts is not one level? Let's say there is two, three level of the relationship between accounts. How would you do that? Um, they would still be related contacts on the other level, and it would still use that related account field. But account. So let's say the three level of account. And mm -hmm. customer, primary customer, let's say is at third level or second level. How would you share all the account, the related one? Are you going to create a multiple lookups to account? So if the if the account is set on those records and that user is set as a related contact on the child accounts and also the grandchild accounts, that related contact lookup field will still work on any records related to any account where they are related contact, it would just at, be at, at any account at any level. You're saying if they are set as a related contact, no. So they would be related only at one level. Let's you say could, they are not. They are not related at the two level, two other accounts. How would that work then? But we would have to relate them to make it work. Why can't we? So account A is a parent. Yep. Account B is the child. Account yep. C is another child. Yep. And the related account is at the account C level. So how would you share all the information about account B and account A? So the contact is related to account B and account C in the hierarchy. They just have relationships to all accounts in the hierarchy. Okay.